Hello, and welcome to AADE's podcast, The Huddle, Conversations with the Diabetes Care Team. In each episode, we speak with guests from across the diabetes care space to bring you perspectives, issues, and updates that elevate your role, inform your practice, and ignite your passion. I'm Kirsten Yale, Research and Proposal Manager at AADE, and in today's show, we're talking about population health. The topic is one of particular interest for AADE because it provides a mechanism to improve the health outcomes for a group of individuals while providing high quality, efficient, and cost-effective care. All important results as healthcare transitions from a fee-for-service model towards value-based care. If you're new to the subject, you may want to check out diabeteseducator.org forward slash population health, where you can find resources that will introduce you to the role of the diabetes care team in population health. Today we have the pleasure of talking to an individual who has been working in population health for many years and breaks down this big idea into manageable concepts and practical applications that any provider can begin implementing in their practice. So, here is today's huddle with AADE past president and diabetes educator, Donna Ryan. So pleased to have Donna Ryan here with us today. Donna is the Regional Director for Population Health at Sacred Heart Health Systems in Florida, and she's also our 2018 AAD past president. So welcome, Donna. Thank you. It's great to be here. So glad to have you. Uh, just to kick this off, really interested to hear a little bit about your experience. You're one of the, I would say, the growing number of people that has population health in their title. So we're starting to see that more. Uh, and just really interested to hear how you got there. Um, well, I started my career as a registered dietitian in uh, Southern California, working in uh, a public health foundation and a population health environment in downtown LA. And we had, um, I had a lot of experience working with programs and large populations of, of people with diabetes. From there, I moved to Florida and started working for Ascension Health, and I work in a population health department that spans from Pensacola, Florida over to Tallahassee, and we have uh, multiple diabetes educators as well as other um, healthcare professionals working to improve the health of our population. Now, how long has your population health department been in place? We started the population health department in 2016. And it is a, a conglomeration or a melding of many different departments. It includes our accountable care organization, um, our inpatient and outpatient programs, our cardiac programs, as well as our mobile health or preventative programs in the community. And very essential to all of these programs are our diabetes programs. We have pediatric and adult uh, endocrinologist and diabetes educators working in the inpatient and outpatient area. We have diabetes self-management education classes. We are in four different hospitals as well as uh, providing diabetes prevention classes. And it sounds like, I mean, it's very integrative, which is so phenomenal to hear. And it also sounds very forward thinking. So it's got to be a fantastic place to work. It's very rewarding. We all have a common mission, and that's, that's really the driving force in working across teams is improving the health of anyone that comes into our services, whether they're in the urgent care, in the ER, or in the inpatient setting. And because of that joint vision that we are taking care of people, not just when we touch them, but when they, are, when they return back to their churches and their neighborhoods, that we provide support and services for them there. Um, so there's a lot of opportunity, there's a lot of gaps, and we're, we're very much driven by our mission to serve the, the poor and the underserved. Incredible. Well, you talked about early on there are teams and how important that was. And then I know we've talked about population health and about how broad and abstract it is, so you need a team, right? Um, I guess just to get us started here, how, how would you define or can you define population health? So it's improving the outcome of a population, everyone in the population, um, and that population is, is defined by the organization or the, or the workforce that is focusing on it. So the population can be um, an entire county. It can be the patients in a clinic. It can be employees. It can be uh, people in a particular insurance program. But defining their, their health and identifying the equity or inequities in that health status. So that's a big job. So how do you reach those people? The, the first thing you have to do is identify the population. Who are you, who's included and who's not included? 
and then look at the data, wherever your data is, if it's an electronic medical record, if it's in doctor's office, if it's in surveys, um, but find out what the data shows. So we often look at um, biometrics. We'll take a look at A1Cs, for example, people with, with diabetes diagnosed or not diagnosed. Identifying those people based on their biometrics and many times um, on outcomes such as going to the ER or going to the doctor's office. And when we identify them that way, then we can plan a strategy. So that reminds me, just hearing you talk about technology, EHRs, how much of an intertwine do you think there is between technology and population health? Well, technology is the, um, we like to say, is the uberization of healthcare, right? We've got a million people in our ACO, and we look at being able to reach all of those people with the information, um, um, medical care that they need. Technology is the easiest, fastest way to do that. We are using technology for, um, uh, for telehealth and telemedicine. We also use technology for remote monitoring, for blood pressure, for glucose, and uh, for in our satellite clinic. So technology is the way to reach many people. So it sounds almost like technology is the tool. Yes. It's a resource, yes. Oh, resource. I like that. I like that. When I started looking into population health, what is population health, I saw this term population medicine pop up, and it seems like there's a difference. What is it, I guess, coming from a, your health system background, what is the difference between population health, population medicine? Can we interchange those words? Or There is a difference. Uh, population medicine very much focuses on um, from my understanding, from my perspective, very much focuses on the medical system and the patients, the people that are in the medical system and their medical management across all of the service lines. So it's very much health center, um, health care provider focus. When, when I think of population health versus population medicine, we know that health is more than your medical care and your interaction with the health care system. Population health includes people outside of the healthcare system that are in the community that maybe do not have a medical home, or if they do, they're not using it, they're not, they're not going. Um, they're in churches, they're in poor, poor zip codes, um, and their health is impacted by things like socioeconomic status and finances. And we even know that it can be affected by their zip code and where they live, as in they're very rural or they live in an area that's impoverished and doesn't have, have resources. So population health is looking at the health of the entire population and not just those that are in your hospital. When I first got, to, um, when we first started with population health and, you know, being in a hospital, there's, there's very much a focus on healthcare utilization from the ER visits and people that visit it quite frequently from readmissions and um, uh, length of stay. So a lot of our programs are focused on reducing unnecessary utilization of health care for the reasons of stewardship and financial impact. And when you only focus on that and you don't focus on that continuum where they live and, and outside of the hospital system, then you're missing a very large part of their health. So when we first got into population health, we would say, well, what's missing? Population. If I'm only going to look at readmissions or I'm only going to look at um, people that are, are in the medical in the EMR, then I'm, I'm missing the rest of the rest of the picture. Does that help? Does that make sense? You know, it makes it makes a lot of sense. Well, I have two teenage boys, and as they've grown up, I, I'm um, I'm sort of like a broken record when I say this to them all the time. I say, "You don't live in a bubble. You're part of a system, right?" So, like our home is our little system, but that doesn't mean that when they go out to the larger population, there anything that they do impacts this broader system, and the and the broader system impacts that, right? So you can kind of think about that. If I'm hearing you correctly, you can kind of think about that with health. Why is it important to think about the people in our community that are not part of our health system, our particular health system, because we're all living together and our health is impacted by the broader system? That's very well said, and that, that really um, illustrates the goal of population health is to, to improve the health of everyone across the spectrum, paying close attention to those that have um, high risk or um, health inequities where they are at risk for poor outcomes.
So my boys will be very happy to hear that I'm on the right track here, right? <laughs> That's right. All right. Can I switch tracks just a little bit, just because it's something that I think that diabetes educators might be interested also um, about the different and the different care models, you know, value-based care, the chronic care model. Um, is there any way you can bring this down to more of a, and, and I know that in our health systems, we all need to be talking about this and fluent when we're talking about these models. Um, is there any way that you can make this easy for us? So value-based payments are based on the, the outcomes of the population, and it is driven by Medicare and payors, where there are contracts or shared savings, say, between uh, the healthcare system and the insurance company for people that are, are identified that have not had um, their A1C done in the last 12 months or their A1C is above a, a certain percentage. If the healthcare system can improve the health of that population, there is an additional um, bonus or payment, increase in payment from the payor for that improved outcome. Um, there are several different models that are out there, and that really is what drives your healthcare system. But because both models are existing, coexisting, the fee for service as well as the value based, um, in healthcare we still have one foot in each door, where we have our ACOs, our, our um, uh, accountable care organizations, who are receiving Medicare bonuses for meeting their benchmarks or HEDIS measures for the Medicare population. And then we have also the billing part that comes when people come in and have their checkups that we're billing Medicare. So we're, we're living in both worlds currently, but the urgency or the future of healthcare is moving towards a value-based model. And that makes a lot of sense. I think it's gonna ultimately, the quality of care for the people with diabetes will increase. You know, I love hearing about these models of care, the directions we're going, population health is a really big idea. But sometimes I wonder, are we losing, you know, when we start thinking really big, are we, are we losing the person? Do you know? I mean, so many people, when they chose this field or chose to become a, an educator, they did it because they were impacted maybe by a person or a story and um, and that, that's what they want to do every day is work with a person. So is there a way to bridge that gap between, you know, working with the person to the larger, broader system of population health? That's the reason that many of us are so passionate about uh, diabetes care and education. Working with the person with diabetes or the person that's impacted or at risk for diabetes is, is, is really our strongest skill set. But I want to give an example of, of how you turn that into a population health model. How do you get from that person-to-person -person interaction engagement that you are really good at as a diabetes educator and make it into a population health model? We'll take um, a patient that I have, uh, Jose, recently diagnosed with uh, type 2 diabetes, and his A1C is 10. When he comes to our diabetes clinic, we, we teach the class we engage, we find out about his culture, and we do everything that we know as diabetes educators um, to help engage him in his own health. Step back from that, and we do that, you know, we're booked six weeks out, 12 weeks out with all the people like Jose that are coming to see us. Well, Jose has a family that either have diabetes or at risk for diabetes. He has an extended family. He has a church community. He has a, a, a small neighborhood. He has an entire county. So how am I, as a diabetes educator, able to affect not just the health of Jose when I'm person to person with him, but build models that also improve the health of all those people that didn't come with Jose for us to talk to? And that's what population health means to me as a diabetes educator. How do I build and design strategies that I can reach Jose's cousins and his neighbors and everyone in the uh, geographic area or with technology outside of the geographic area to provide them with the information, prevention, and screening that they need to stay healthy? That's the beauty and the challenge of it. So I, I think about my staff. I have diabetes educators, as I've said, that are booked out one-to-one -one and in classes for you know, six or eight weeks at a time. They don't have the day-to-day -day capacity to build that population health model, 
but someone on the team, they know that it's there and they know, but someone on the team has the ability to help put that model into effect. So we have weekly, monthly huddles looking at strategies and opportunities. How can I take one person, one RDCDE, one RNCDE, and not touch just eight, six or eight people a day, but 600 or 800 people over the course of the next month to two months to three months. And we do that by building strategies that include technology, telehealth, by using um, social marketing and social media to reach people, and working with the primary care providers and the ACO uh, to make sure that we are embedded in their practice as well as uh, using community health workers. We have some non-licensed, non-credentialed diabetes support team that work with that population too. So I hope that I, I got across was we still work one-on-one with, with the people that come to see us, but we have strategies and programs in place to reach across the population. Those are pretty innovative, right? I love that idea of innovation using technology as a tool. Um, how did you guys come up with that? How did you figure out how to do it? It's a learning curve, but you really start with your administration. We're not siloed within the healthcare team, or we shouldn't be, sometimes we are, but within the healthcare team, those innovations come from groupthink and from strategic initiatives that the hospital has. So by talking to um, the administrators in the hospital, everyone has a boss. I have an idea. We want to reach more people. Um, um, and uh, using the technology that's already available. And in our case, we did not have the telehealth platform um, in the hospital. And if my staff's listening, they're going to be laughing. It took us three years three years to get to get it in place, to get it approved, and to buy it with all the grants, and to get it set up. But now it's it's there, and uh, it's it's really improved access to care. So if I can ask just a brief sidebar on telehealth, just because it's a huge topic, especially thinking about mm-hmm. population health. It's what I've been hearing all about, population health, telehealth. But I'm most interested in hearing, like, what kind of technology does it take? Like, do you have to have a camera set up in your hospital system and then a camera set up in specific places? Or is the technology broadband strong enough? It, that used to be like that. So one of the reasons that it took so long is because of the HIPAA. Oh, right, right, yes. That took long. Mm-hmm. So we had to have a secured network and we had to have, you're right, the bi-directional communication. It's different than just putting it on YouTube. We could put all of our classes on YouTube, but how do they ask questions and and how do you really engage someone? Um, So that we have um, uh, the new technology now. Anyone with a a smartphone that has a Zoom, um, we use the Zoom platform. And I have a camera on the laptops and the computers of my staff. And then we do have a a Zoom camera um, in, in one of the conference rooms that we do the classroom. So it doesn't take a lot of capital anymore it used to yeah so when you're talking about telehealth you're talking about like educator to patient right just those two but then there's also the big classrooms so you can do um if you especially if you have a church so earlier you were talking about reaching these broad populations so if you have a church or a community center or ymca whoever that might have the ability to broadcast up to a bigger audience say 30 people that's exactly what happens and do you remember that that old TV show, um, um, all their faces come on the screen. Oh, the Brady Bunch? Brady Bunch, okay. So it's kind of like the Brady Bunch. So you don't have to have a huge special TV, maybe a smart TV, you know. So, um, but you have the screen, and you have the laptop connected to it. And we will have, we can have up to 500 people call in. And you can have the faces on, on there. So our faith community nurses call in. They will call in from wherever they are and listen to the class or the congregation. Um, will call in. So that's exactly the way that works. And you think that um, actually seeing the face and the body language is more productive than just doing a telephone call? I'm not sure the evidence shows that yet, but what it is, it's that bi-directional communication builds the relationship. It's harder to build a relationship with just a phone call. Right. But if you have a visual back and forth, that's very powerful. And we use it even professionally. But what's great about the telehealth, too, is people can opt in. They don't have to share their camera view. Right. They don't have to be on there. And that's very HIPAA compliant, too. If you want to be seen by the rest of the group, you turn on your camera. 
if you just want to if you just want to uh, do your voice, then that's fine too. Yeah, I mean, there's multiple possibilities. It's kind of exciting, but we've talked about offline this problem of reaching. 30 million people with diabetes. And then when you think about population health, it really is these 80 plus million of prediabetes because that's the health of our communities. So thinking about strategies to reach that group. And you, you hit on it a little bit earlier, but I've also heard you talk about, um, and this was something I loved hearing you say, the idea of a chronic disease in an acute care world. Can you talk a little bit about that? Because I just loved that. Yeah. Diabetes is a chronic disease in an acute care world. And what, what we mean by that is when you're in a hospital setting or a clinic setting or an urgent care or an ER, many times diabetes is number 10 on the problem list. It even shows up on the problem list. But we know as diabetes educators, that could very much be what's driving that uh, UTI or the infection that is now going septic or um, the GI problems. There's, a, there's an underlying diabetes um, diabetes impact on the acute situation. But depending on your provider and your staff, they may not recognize that. So many times diabetes or glycemia, glucose, we call it the stepchild. It's not on the problem list and it's not immediately addressed unless it's the primary reason for the visit. So the hospital is built around diagnoses and, and services that treat traumas and surgeries and sepsis and uh, cardiac events. And diabetes glucose management does not always get the focus. As diabetes educators, that's what we bring to the picture. And that's why we need to be at the table. So when you talk about strategies to improve population health, the number one strategy to improve the health of a population, which we know at least 20 to 30 percent of them have diabetes or up to 50 percent depending on the population or prediabetes. A diabetes educator, a diabetes care and education specialist at the table looking at the data, listening to the interventions and the conversations of the other healthcare team, that's our number one strategy for improving the health of the diabetes population. Um, We bring that skill set and we are as good as not better than many of the other care team members in I- identifying opportunities to improve the health of people with diabetes. One of the opportunities that we have is expanding the focus of the healthcare system away from just the A1C. That is, it's an easy lab marker and they define their success or not with diabetes management based on that, but we know that there are so many other biometric markers that can be used and outside of the biometric markers, um, the quality of life markers for people with diabetes. So when we're building a population health program, yes, we have A1C on our dashboard. Yes, we have it on our tracking system, but we're looking at blood pressure. We're looking at cholesterol. We're looking at tobacco use or cessation. Um, We're looking at um, uh, uh, vaccinations and appropriate use of primary care versus Um, versus going to the ER every time you get ill. There are a lot of things that we can bring um, and that we do bring to that population health model. And that's really why it is so important that diabetes care and education specialists inject themselves into the population health model wherever you practice. If you're practicing in a hospital setting or in a clinic setting, outpatient, if you're in a uh, FQHC, wherever you are, there is an opportunity to identify the way to improve the health of the population of people with diabetes in your area. And the first place you would start is by talking to your administration, talking to your boss, talking to their boss, looking at the strategic initiative. We're all driven by strategic initiatives. It might not say diabetes anywhere in that strategic initiative. It might say CHF. It might say reducing reducing the number of uh, traumas or deaths. But there's something in there that has underlying impact of diabetes, and that's, and that's where we can start. I also want to point out, um, I've been talking about biometrics, or, you know, lab tests and things that are in the electronic medical record um, are hopefully easy to, to collect and report on. Um, but what your hospital administrator is really looking at, maybe even more so than, than I realized before getting into population health, they're looking at the healthcare dollar. 
this population health model and value-based comes down to looking at cost of health care for this population. And that cost of health care is either going to make or break the health care system. So our models are based on not only improving the health of people in that population, in our case we're, we're looking at the diabetes and cardiometabolic, but reducing their health care spend because that impacts the, um, the revenue and the budget of the hospital. I feel like raising my hands and cheering right now <laughs> because, you know, you here you can actually make a difference in the health of the population while the, your health system gets a, get, has a higher ROI. And so it's a win-win for everybody, right? And I think maybe it was set up that way, um, especially looking back at the ACA, and that might be another podcast we can talk about. Um, so win-win for everybody, healthier population, higher return on investment for the health system. Can you explain how that works? I want to give an example of a, a return on investment model that we use with our um, diabetes education program. We have two counties that are 200% below poverty level, very high incident of diabetes um, and other chronic diseases. We designed a program to see if we could improve the health of this population. I started with um, two nurses and a healthcare worker. Identifying the people in the community that had diabetes, and at that point we didn't even identify their A1Cs or we, we just we identified them and asked them if they wanted to participate in this diabetes program that would give them the tools that they need to take care of themselves but also to help them find the medications that they could afford and to get resources that they needed. So those people that wanted to participate, well, you can imagine not 100% of people want to participate, <laughs> but for those that wanted to participate, so that was point zero. That was ground zero. When I had my list, we had our list of 300 names of people that wanted to participate in the program. We went back into the um, claims data, and you have to get someone out of finance in your health system to do this, put in their medical record number and their information and found out how many times they'd been to the ER, how many times they had been admitted, how many times they had been readmitted, and what, um, what they were billed and what the revenue was for those stays. So you can imagine that was multiple millions of dollars for that population, 300 people. That, that was ground zero. We enrolled them in the program, and the program consists of assessment, and engagement, what's important to them, do they want to quit smoking, and sometimes we got in there and found out that it wasn't even improving their health that they needed help with. Their plumbing didn't work, they didn't have enough um, money for food, and there were um, safety issues in their house. So, so we start with helping them with the basics, Maslow's hierarchy of what they need, and then started slowly providing over the course of, uh, of one to two to three months diabetes education, which also included blood pressure, diet, being able to afford the medications. The program has run for an entire year, and then we rerun the claims data and compare how many times they've been to the ER, how many times they've been admitted, how many times they've been readmitted. The number was drastically reduced. So with the help of my finance office, I was able to calculate the savings in health care costs for that population, for every person that worked with our diabetes educators and worked in this program, we saved between $4,400 and $8,800 per person on average, depending on their location. $4,400 to $8,800 per person. Now, we reduced their A1Cs, we, they lost weight, their blood pressures got better. All the things that are important to us happened, all those biometrics. But the healthcare system and the administrators now have, a, have a, a, a business model that allowed me to hire more people, that allowed us to expand. And it's also brought in extra resources by doing that and seeing that, that soft touch and that engagement. Now you're, we're going back to that person-centered. With that, then um, we have received grants and other resources. So that's a healthcare model that is a return on investment that is um, not a heavy lift, um, if you take a look at your population now in your diabetes areas and look at their health care utilization, their visits, their dollars, pick a time frame and a year to two years prior to them 
um, being engaged with you and your staff, and then run the data again a year. We're now running it annually. This program's been running for six years, so you can imagine. And it's we refine it, and um, we get more resources, and now we've expanded to six other counties. Um, but that simple model is the model of value-based care that we improve the health of the population and also reduce um, reduce their health care spend. So value-based care in action. That's really neat. I heard you early on say that you partnered with your finance person or your administrator. How early did you draw that person in? Did you go, so I would think you're the subject matter expert, and then there, so you have IT, subject matter expert, finance person. It all seems to be, all of those groups really have to be working together. How early did you bring them in? For the, the, um, the finance department, um, it was at ground zero. It was at ground zero. When I, we assessed the, the population, identified the population, um, and uh, designed a strategy, you, you need to know where you've come from. And so we already had the biometrics, and we know, we know what their A1C is and their blood pressure and their BMI, and, but we didn't know the finance part of it. What impact have they had on the healthcare system? There are many different ways of working with your finance department, but you get a finance partner or business partner, or if you have access to the claims data, sometimes you can get access to the claims data, and it's as simple as, as running the medical record number or the, um, or the patient identifier with the time frame, and it will pull up. I almost think you could say, like, hey, I know that there's this big health system in Florida that has a model that shows the ROI when they implement these population health strategies, it, just simply saying that to an administrator in a academic medical center, community hospital, safety net organization, any of those seems like you'd, you'd get somebody's ear. And that's a great point. We're not unique, and this is population health. In other health ministries in Ascension, similar models are happening, um, working with children with asthma who ha have a chronic condition and admissions and readmissions and and um, that self-management component is missing, the savings of simply putting in a strategy that is person-focused on those high-risk utilizers, giving the, the parents and the kids the education, making sure they can afford the inhalers and that they know the difference between a long a long acting and short acting and inhaler it's not much different than diabetes taking the right medication at the right time for the for rescue or for maintenance um, we have people go in those programs go out to their homes and see the condition of the carpets and the environmental conditions provide resources to clean it up over and over this model works and that's really a part of population health whether you're looking at whether it's asthma or it's diabetes or it's cardiac or it's pregnancy looking at those that population, keeping in mind that some of them need more assistance than others, making sure that you have the resources, but most importantly, not, not doing it in a silo, making sure that you're aligned with your administration and that you know your impact, not just on the health outcomes, but on the financial outcomes, because that is what will drive the model. And it, it supports the quadruple aim, where you're improving the health of a population, you're improving the health of the person, you're supporting the provider. All providers want the people that see them to, to do well. It's providing resources for them. It's saving money for the healthcare system. And it's improving the healthcare experience for everyone. Well, and when I am listening to you talk, I'm reminded of patient safety and quality. And I think anytime you can align patient safety and quality and finances in the healthcare system, that will always make an administrator happy, those two pieces. So I think we're coming to the end of our time. This has been a fantastic conversation. I think we just scratched the surface of what it really is. And I hope that we, we made it less abstract and more tangible. Yes, it's a theoretical framework that includes a lot of things that we're not experts at, but what we are experts at, person-centered care, integration of self-management education and clinical management of diabetes and cardiometabolic. The AADE vision that we have recently rolled out supports population health across the pillars. It's taking the person in a holistic view, including the healthcare team in that focus, and improving the outcomes, the quality of life of people with diabetes and cardiometabolic conditions 
preventing complications, and at the same time, improving the financial impact of health care. It's a win-win situation, and we are the right people to do this. And sometimes when I talk about population health, that I, I get a glazed look in the eyes of my staff. But when I talk about, okay, so that 27-year-old pregnant with twins on an insulin pump that you just saw, there are another hundred of patients like that in the community that you're not seeing. How are we going to find them? What's the strategy to find them and provide support? Well, you did make it tangible. And I'll say this, I think you you piqued my interest more. I mean, I think there's many more conversations to come here. Um, And I think you scratched the surface and made it really tangible with sharing your experiences and sharing the model. So I have to say thank you. I can't tell you how much I appreciated this conversation. Um, And I hope we can continue this offline. Thank you very much. It's been a pleasure. Thank you for listening to this week's episode of The Huddle, Conversations with the Diabetes Care Team. Today, we heard about the wide range of benefits population health approach can offer diabetes care programs. We learned how diabetes care and education specialists can begin looking at biometric data to start defining which groups of individuals might benefit from a population health strategy, and how technology is a key resource practitioners can use to better reach individuals and communities that may be hard to reach. Donna's firsthand experience illustrates the diabetes care team is favorably positioned to deliver this innovative model of care, to amplify their reach and deliver positive outcomes. Remember that tracking the right data is key to measuring these outcomes, and that involving collaborators from finance and IT will help the success of this strategy. I hope today's episode inspires you to take a closer look at population health and consider implementing it in your own practice. Consider elevating your role as we see it in Project Vision by stepping up to the challenge of offering care that positively impacts quality and cost and enhances the experience for both the person with diabetes and the provider. I encourage you to learn more about population health at diabeteseducator.org forward slash population health and about AADE's vision for the future of diabetes care at diabeteseducator.org forward slash vision. To access these links and notes from today's discussion, please visit diabeteseducator.org forward slash podcast. The information in this podcast is for informational purposes only and may not be appropriate or applicable for your individual circumstances. This podcast does not provide medical professional advice and is not a substitute for consultation with a healthcare professional. Please consult your healthcare professional for any medical questions.